All right, so we'll wait for people to kind of stream in here. All right. I'm going to go grab Noah real quick. Okay. Got to make sure we get this streamed on Facebook. Yep. All right, everyone, I think we are going to go ahead and get started. So just a couple disclaimers before we get going. If this is your first time on a green cover webinar, just know that as an attendee, your mic is muted and your screen is hidden so that we can devote all of our energy to our presenter today. If you do happen to come up with questions, go ahead and utilize the question and answer feature down at the bottom of your screen. You can submit those questions during the presentation, and then we will get to those after the conclusion of our presentation. So my name is Sophie. I'm on the education and marketing team here at Green Cover, and I am super excited for today's presentation with Steve Groff. So Steve is one of the pioneers of the cover crop movement in the U.S. He brought the tillage radish to fame and really helped launch the soil health movement as we know it today. He has been a tireless proponent of cover crops and soil health, and we consider him both a great friend and a mentor. Today, Steve is going to be sharing with us his nutrient density journey. This is a talk that I think a lot of us are especially interested and excited about as we continue to explore the impact that soil health has on plant health, human health, and ecology. Many of us feel intuitively that food is medicine and that the quality and nutrient density of the food we consume does in fact matter. This technology is moving towards actually being able to prove that intuition. So special thanks and gratitude to you, Steve, for making time to come on to chat with us about your work today. And I will go ahead and pass it on over to you. Well, thank you so much, Sophie. And hello, everybody. Uh, good to be with you today. Uh, I would just say in response to the introduction, which was great, by the way, so if you appreciate that, is, uh, you know, uh, I think Keith Burns and I have known each other for, it's well over 10 years, maybe 15 years, and we've kind of had this somewhat, you might say, parallel track in, uh, in cover crops and so forth, but you know what's really interesting? Uh, almost all of us who were, were, I'll say, buddies back in the day, all we talked about was no-till and cover crops. We barely even mention that anymore. Uh, and today, you know, I'm not going to mention that very much. I never dreamed that I'd be talking about um, health, human health. Oh, yeah, soil health. We, we're into that, of course. But now we're taking that a step further. And I really think it's cool that those of us in this movement, whatever you want to call it, regenerative agriculture, there's all kinds of different names. I'm not big on labels, but you know, really what we're trying to do is, uh, and I like to say it this way, we're trying to help people and we're trying to help the planet as well and be a good steward of what God has entrusted us. And I know I share those values with Green Cover Seed and uh, that's just what makes us a, uh, I just think, you know, good friends and also, you know, trying to do some uh, similar goals. So anyway, a little bit about me. I'm a third generation farmer, literally living in the house that my grandparents bought in 1935. 
I've been all over the world uh, helping to educate farmers and those who influence agriculture. And historically, it's been about no-till and cover crops and, uh, and those type of things. But more recently, uh, I think you could say I pivoted a little bit because I see the future. I see where the future's going. I wrote a book. Uh, you can see it there on the right-hand side of the screen, The fu Future Proof Farm. Uh, Keith gave a nice testimony about it. Um, and that's really encompasses a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. I talk about the nutrient density meter in that book. You can get it at stevegroff.com. So um, I believe the future of agriculture is growing nutrient dense foods, but it doesn't stop there. It's not just about doing that and measuring it and all that. We wanna enhance human health and well being. And sometimes we talk about health and everything and health is such a broad topic, but it's not just about the physical side of things. There's emotional things as well. All this can go back to food and how food was grown. All that can impact our human health. And uh, so I think that's quite profound when we think of that, because most farmers these days, that doesn't enter their mind. All they want to know is, what's my ROI on these cover crops? That's all they want to know. But I think we're seeing a shift to more and more farmers are seeing the future and where it's going. So that's really what our topic is today. And I want to share with you my journey, uh, my journey in being able to um, learn more and more about nutrient density. So my nutrient density journey. Um, first started some tests back in the year 2000. That's 22 years ago with a guy um, from the USDA. And I'm not sure how we met, but I sent him some samples and he analyzed them for me. It would have been some of my squash that I was growing. And at the time I tested higher in nutrients like you know calcium and magnesium and, and things like that that we're kind of interested in with uh, human health. And my squash tested higher in 13 different nutrients that were tested, minerals, uh, then the USDA average. I didn't say standard because there's no standard. To this day, there is no standard. We don't know what a butternut squash has the potential to do. Um, we're learning, but we do know what the averages are. And so that's what we have to go on. So if I'm doing better than average, that was encouraging. And so that was great. And then about four years ago, three or four years ago, I heard about a nutrient density meter, something that you could measure the nutrients and the minerals in crops, in foods we eat. And the idea that really piqued my interest was this meter, if it can be calibrated and figured out that it's we're confident enough in it, you can literally go to the grocery store and buy your tomatoes based on the nutrient density or the nutrient values of the various brands or various uh, you know, tomato selections that you have there on the grocery store shelf. Well, you know, I immediately know, and I think you guys agree, that'll be a game changer if it could ever happen. Well, there has been some progress. And I don't want to disappoint everybody because uh, I'm not trying to do clickbait here or anything like that. But that meter is not quite ready yet for public use. But I got one here. This is version, version two. Uh, there's a picture there on the, on the right-hand side of your screen. And I have just gotten this actually literally uh, two weeks ago. And then I had to get the accompanying um, uh, tablet, which I just got several days ago. So I haven't had much time to play with it. I did play with the original one and it was stated when it came out that it wasn't ready to go yet, but they wanna get database. And so they can refine it and uh, you know make it more consistent and so forth. So uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, we're in version two and there'll probably be one or two more versions as I hear. 
before we really get something that is gonna be fit for the public. So there is about 300 of these around the nation. Uh, you have to be a member of the Bionutrient Association. Uh, you can go look at the Bionutrient Association, BionutrientFoodAssociation.org. Look it up, read about it, and you can understand a lot more about what they're trying to do with that. So there's a, quite a few of us who are, are working with this. And um, one of the things that I do appreciate is the thoroughness of it. I think we're all a little frustrated that it's not going faster. But the thoroughness of it, like what we're doing is we're taking some tests. We're also sending in samples like last fall. I sent in butternut squash that I grow. I'm a vegetable farmer. And they asked me to take soil tests literally underneath where the vine was that that squash grew because they wanted the exact measurements of the soil uh, to help determine and see if there's correlations there of what they can measure in the soil and then actually what gets into the squash. So I can really appreciate the thoroughness of this. There are tens of thousands of data points in the database. And if you go to the Bionutrient um, Association and look at their uh, website, dig around a little bit, and you can see some of the uh, data that they have in that. So I'm going to uh, advance to the next slide and you'll see a, a picture of a woods. Um, and I live in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, that's uh, why it's called Pennsylvania. It was almost 100% woodland when William Penn found it 400 years ago. Now here's the reason I'm showing you this picture. When you look at this picture, what do you see? You see green, growth, healthy, looks awesome, right? Well, you look really close and you honestly can't see any nutrient deficiencies. At least I haven't seen any yet. Uh, that being said, no fertilizer has been applied to this woods ever. And so the curiosity within me made me go and take a soil test. I wonder what the soil is like there. How does this work? It must be a perfect soil. Well, I don't know how many of you took a soil test of your woods, or maybe I should say, since some of you are from more open land and prairies and so forth, an undisturbed area, I would encourage you to do it sometime. Even if you have a piece on your farm, a, a, a fence row or something that you know wasn't disturbed for maybe ever, take a soil test there and just uh, see what it reads. So for me, I, my soil test came back. There was a few things that were what I thought was fairly normal. Now, again, taking a soil test now is in the context of usually growing crops. So what a crop would need versus what a woods would need could be different, but what was was very, very interesting to me is like, for instance, my base saturation for calcium. Uh, normally we like to see that 70% or higher in our fields. In my woods, 29%. And we would say nothing could grow there. Even in the woods, you would think that. Why does this work? Well, I'll just say in short, it's the biology. It's the biology. It's the microbes and all the living life that there, that's what makes us work. That is the way life was designed to function, no matter how you look at it, the biology. So what can we learn from this is the question. No, I'm not suggesting we go out and forage for berries and nuts. Not gonna say, not gonna do that. But what can we learn from this? And this is my whole point here. When we talk about nutrient density, how does it work when man, humankind, leaves things alone, things seem to work just fine without many problems. How can we grow our food in a way that is healthy to our bodies and we can have uh, better health? You know, it's interesting when you think about it. We are living longer today than ever before, but I would argue we're sicker than ever before as a society, particularly with chronic diseases and autoimmune issues and stuff like that. Why is that? I'm not gonna get into that today, but what I wanna say is eating better, eating right, and the way we grow our foods, it's not just the foods you eat, although that's a large portion of it, but how we grow our foods can make a difference. 
And I think a lot of you are going to be quite pleased to know that we are going down the right path here with cover crops, low soil disturbance, no soil disturbance, diversity, all the things that we in the soil health movement, which I'll call it that now, are doing leads up to better food. I think theoretically, we always were hoping that that was the case, but I'm gonna show you some data here soon and some examples of what I mean by that. Well, let's start with my situation. These are some butternut squash that I grew a couple years ago. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, you see seven beautiful butternut squash. On the right-hand side, you see some that are getting uh, rotten. So I grew both sides here. Now on the left side, you can see the notation underneath there is from my fields, long-term no-till, cover crops, diversity, pretty, pretty good mix of that. The story on the right side is a neighbor called me up in February and said, hey, can you grow, um, I want you to grow, um, I guess they, rent, they wanted to rent it to me to grow um, squash. And so I used my variety. In other words, these varieties are the same. That field had been conventionally farmed. It had been moldboard plowed up until recently. And it was corn on corn on corn for who knows how long. Well, it's February. So I decided as soon as possible to plant a mix of peas and oats, which is a good late winter, early spring cover crop. And then I no-tilled into that in the beginning of June. So the point I wanna make though here is even though that year I used no-till and that year I used cover crops, it was literally like two months, three months before the crop was planted. In the fall, I took samples from both, put them in my, the in my garage in my house. And in December, I started smelling something <laughs> and I thought, wow, something's going bad. And I looked and sure enough, the ones that were grown in a conventional tilled situation, no diversity, pretty much no soil life, were starting to rot. And this was like, oh my goodness, this is really, really, really insightful. So <clears throat> I think this shows us what is possible with healthy soil. This is a very simple um, thing that I did on my farm. Now, I kind of wish I would have took samples of that and got them analyzed at a you know nutrient mineral level just to see what the differences were, but it you know this is probably good enough to convince you that there is a strong difference. Now uh, I also grow some hemp, and I just want to tell another little story on that before we get back to the nutrient density meter. So I grow CBD hemp, and uh, one of the things that I like to um, I'm not afraid to try new things. And you know, to my knowledge, there's, I'll just put it this way, not many farmers who are no-tilling CBD hemp using cover crops, particularly in a long-term no-till situation. So um, those of you who are not from the Mid-Atlantic region wouldn't know this, but Penn State Medicine um, is, is well known for a lot of their research. And they're very much in the, in the national scene. They happen to have a research facility dedicated to cannabis. And uh, they're studying CBD hemp and the, the CBD uh, product that comes from hemp. And without going into all the details, I got involved with that. And I got a phone call one day and I felt like I was being interrogated. And I wasn't sure you know, where this was going, but they're like, what are you doing? How are you growing this CBD? And I came to find out that of all the CBDs they tested, the one I, that was grown on our farm was showing the most effect on killing colon cancer cells and killing some melanoma type cancer cells and they also stated that the CBD was the equivalent of Tylenol in pain management. And so I'm like, whoa, wow, okay, that's awesome. So that was three years ago. 
so the past two years we've been doing research here where we're comparing hemp grown on my best fields, my longest term, my healthiest fields, and I'm doing soil health tests and all that. So I, I have a good background here knowing where my healthiest fields are, where my healthiest scores are and all. With some of my, I'll just say not as good fields. And I do have a cooperating neighbor, full disclosure, he knows what I'm doing. Comes from more of a you know, conventional background. So we've been growing hemp uh, in that. And then we were testing it to see the differences. It's the exact same variety we're testing. So uh, once this season is over, uh, if our numbers continue to go as they, they were, we'll be able to publish a paper on this. And as you'll see later in my uh, presentation, one of the taglines I use for a CBD is better soil, better oil. So uh, I know mean, that's a cute kind of catchy thing, but we're, be, we're able to back it up. And so I, so I just wanted you to understand that this is beyond theory now. We're starting to put some research behind it. And you know, we can go to the lab and we can test everything, but boy, when this nutrient density meter gets you know, ready for you know, the general public to use, it's going to be a game changer, I believe. So at the risk of you guys thinking that I'm self-promoting, I guess I am a little, but these are our products that we are uh, manufacture, sell, I should say grow, manufacture and sell uh, on our farm, our CBD products. But we're using our story. Uh, you know, good health grows with better soil. We're telling our story. And I'm saying those of us who are in the regenerative agriculture movement, soil health movement, we have a story to tell. And whenever I'm talking to non-farmers, without fail, everyone loves what I do. You need to learn to tell that story. You need to tell your story. What is your story? And I know that we all don't have all the data and everything to back it up, but just tell them, you know, we grow cover crops. It keeps the soil covered. If those of you who live you know, in the prairies, our soil doesn't blow when it's windy and cause, you know, multi-pile, multi-car pileups on the interstate. I'm from the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and that's been kind of a uh, hot spot, you might say, for uh, looking at agriculture pollution and so forth. And when people in my region say, well, what, what's a cover crop? I'm like, I plant a cover crop so that I keep the nitrates and the fertilizer out of the Chesapeake Bay and also your well water too. And that hits home with that. And uh, then I can tell that story. And it's always, why aren't more farmers doing this? And so we have a story to tell. And I'm gonna connect some of the dots here uh, a little bit later on coming up here about the whole thing to get to nutrient density, you're gonna have to use regenerative agriculture practices uh, to do that. Okay, let's, let's look now to the human health. What, what's our culture like today? You go, you visit the health practitioner and the health practitioner says, you have a disease caused by your diet. And the patient says, should I change my diet? And the health practitioner says, oh no, not at all. Here is a pill, right? Isn't that what's going on in our, isn't that what's going on today? I would argue that's just treating the symptom. Offering a solution that keeps you dependent on products and services. Now don't run with me too far here. I'm not against pills. I'm not against drugs in a, in a prescriptive manner for certain things. I'm not against hospitals, not against doctors, nurses. No, 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 no. But we've depended way too much on treating the symptoms rather than treating the problem. The problem is when we offer a solution that you don't have to be dependent on products and services. That's what we're talking about with nutrient dense food. And it's not like also you're gonna eat the best food in the world and never sick, get sick or never die. We're all gonna die. And we probably all will get you know, a little sick once in a very few time, hopefully. But you understand my point. We want to set ourselves up to be healthy and we have to grow our food in the right way to do that. 
Um, this is a really dramatic graphic from the Kiss the Ground folks. Uh, if you haven't seen Kiss the Ground movie, I'd, I'd encourage you to do so. It's quite thought provoking at the very least. Um, it, you know, not everybody's going to agree with everything that's portrayed, but it's, it's really overall really, really good. And, you know, here, you know, on the left hand side is kind of depicting conventional agriculture, full scale tillage, you know, it's like, you know, farmers get up and it's like, what am I going to kill today? That's kind of the mentality that farmers have rather than how can I put more life in my operation? That's how the right side there is, is, uh, is, is depicted. And I think we in agriculture need to think about that more. There, there, you, you, you solve one problem, there's going to be more problems coming up. It's not easy. Trust me. It's not easy to be in regenerative agriculture. I have failures every year. I try not to make them too big, but I, I you know, we learn from them and uh, I'm not going to get into the whole part of that, but I'm telling you that this is the direction we are going from left to right in that picture there. I don't so much care where you're at on this picture, but I do care in what direction you're headed. And if you're not headed to the to the right side there of more life, more biodiversity, all that, I think your farm could become obsolete someday. And I don't say that as a threat, I just say as a heads up, because this is where we're headed, I feel, in agriculture. So with that, let's get up to date here a little bit. Here's a closer picture of the meter itself. Uh, and right now, and this is just an update here, it's from the Bionutrient Institute and you can just look them up, bionutrientinstitute.org, and um, you know, spend a, an hour or two on their website. There's a lot of data you can you can look at, a lot of information where they have taken all kinds of different things and tested them in a lab, and are now trying to do what we do in the lab with this meter here. So um, that's just a little bit update in the meter. You might want to know how is it going to work. Well. I just copied and pasted this right out of the website so I wouldn't get it wrong. The bionutrient meter is a handheld spectrometer that works through the principle of spectroscopy. I think I'm saying that's right. Uh, the bionutrient meter has lights or LEDs that emit light at a very specific wavelength and then bounce off objects. And there lists a bunch of them there, even soil. Um, uh, actually, I was told here just last week, we had a webinar on this, that they're looking at doing a SAP analysis uh, at some point. That would be really cool if you could actually go out in your fields and, and test the, the SAP like we kind of do with our bricks, with our refractometers uh, and get a bunch of more readings. So that's on the agenda anyway. But anyway, um, a light sensor and a device reads how much light bounces back for each wavelength very quickly and multiple times to a given measurement. So here's a little diagram that might help you understand a little bit better. Um, and I don't know if you can see in this unit here, not much to see, but there's, when you turn them on, there's all kinds of lights burst forth out of that. It is kind of cool. Uh, it is kind of cool looking when, it, when you can do that. But anyway, this is just a, a quick, you know, so if you wonder how it works, you can go up to an apple, tomato, um, wheat grains, grains, whatever, and it's going to give uh, back a reading. Now, you kind of wonder, well, why can't, why can't they get this figured out? Well, there's so many nuances. There's, there's so many that uh, the way this meter works is it has to be connected to the internet. And I have over here a tablet uh, here that I got to connect it to, or you can do, do it to smartphones. And it has to be connected to interview internet to be able to take these readings and then compare them to the database online. So now you understand it's a little complicated. It's not just like a refractometer is so freaking simple uh, that you do you just there's you usually just look at and you can see the bricks levels, which by the way, by the way, a refractometer. Um, is a very good thing to use. If you know what the ranges should be in a given crop, um, this, this device here is like taking a refractometer to a whole new level. But for goodness sake, get a refractometer and play around with it yourself now. That, that's very reliable. Um, now you, you can go and, and find hundreds of examples of, of what, what all it means, but 
I would just encourage you to do that if you're if you're furious with something like that. So now let's get into the little bit of the science. So the readings that you're seeing on this chart here, nutrient variation is huge. These are the laboratory results. Okay, these are results in a laboratory, which shows you the need for this meter to uh, to be functional. So uh, if you look at this here, the, the wider the bar of any given one, like, like you go down there, you can see kale, that, that green bar there, that's, that breadth there means that there's very wide, uh, there's very wide differences on the nutrient values. In this case, if we're looking at calcium uh, in all the samples they tested, and usually it's, it's a couple hundred. Um, and, but you know, it's interesting, you look at something like tomatoes and peppers, uh, blueberries, there's not so much difference between, you know, all the different ways they're grown. That, that is fascinating uh, just to, just, you know, just to know that. So what it can do is if you're a consumer care to, that cares about your health, and it, particularly with calcium, I mean, there you, you can look at 10 or 12 other ones too. Uh, some of these vegetables, it's, it's not, there's not as much variation to that. Uh, but what's nice about the database that is being um, being developed here is it goes against uh, also where the produce was grown, how it was grown, uh, and a lot of other variables. And if you can get into the dashboard of the Bionutrient Association, you can just almost any different type of, um, of, of product out there, and you can you can understand uh, you know some of the variables behind it. So I wanna show you one here that I think most of our audience today can relate to. Uh, any of you who grow wheat and any of you who are a no-till farmer, uh, this is one chart that was fascinating. Fascinating to me because I guess you could call me a diehard no-tiller because I haven't tilled anything in my farm since 1996. That's like 26 years. I started in 1982. So some fields not no tillers in 40 years. So yep, I, I'm, I'm admitting it. I'm a diehard no tiller. Um, also use a lot of cover crops in the last 20, 30 years. But look at this chart here. Uh, the zero, the zero in this case, the zero represents uh, the no till. And the blue bars represent light tillage, which is like disking. Uh, or shallow, whatever, field cultivators, or whatever you call it in your region. Heavy tillage is more like chiseling or moldboard plowing. So they looked at these different things here, antioxidants, uh, polyphenols, proteins, uh, magnesium, calcium, iron, potassium, sulfur, and so on. And look at the shift here. And essentially what this means is where these other practices were held, we had lower nutrient density lower nutrient density. So you, it begs the question, why? Uh, and, and this has been, this has been one thing that keeps coming up in the data, keeps coming up. Tillage has an effect on nutrient density. And, and, and so you start asking the question, why? And I'm not gonna get into this deep here today. It'd be a whole webinar in itself, but we probably all are familiar with mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi is responsible for taking nutrients in the, from the soil into the plant roots. Mycorrhizal fungi is killed or destroyed with tillage. So that's my simple answer. It's the mycorrhizal fungi. Now it's bigger than that. Uh, you know, earthworms have a hard time with a lot of tillage and a, and, a, and a lot of other microbes for that matter. But I'll just maybe leave it at there. This is interesting data, very interesting data, and it kind of supports uh, the whole concept of low or no soil disturbance. So <clears throat> I'm going to start wrapping up here, and I want you to get your questions ready here in a couple minutes. And uh, so, Sophie, you can start lining them up a while for me. Um, but here's some key takeaways. And, and again, this is the kind of talk that would take hours to really get more thorough on it. Nutrient deficiencies are directly related to microbe deficiencies. And we're finding that out. You know, when you look at the data here and so forth, we're finding that out. 
Uh, so there again, tillage is a factor, also cover crops, diversity. Uh, you, you mentioned cover crops. If you build it, they will come, the microbes that is. I, um, I just heard yesterday, I was talking to, to, to um, I'll call him an agriculture consultant who was working with some farmers in California in almond orchards, which if you know anything about almond orchards, they pretty much grow them like, like they're in a parking lot. They want not a weed in sight, nothing, nothing underneath those almond trees. And it's just like, you know, it's just packed soil basically. They started uh, working with the farmer, incorporated cover crops and, you know, more of a system, diverse system, and earthworms started showing up. The question was asked, where did those earthworms come from? Because they, they did not see them as some people have done. They did not put them there. Where did they come from? And I've also seen myself by using, I use, I still use some herbicides in my farm. I'm not organic. Uh, so just, you know, in case you were wondering, uh, since I've been reducing uh, herbicides, I've started to see things like red clover appear in my fields. I haven't planted red clover even as a cover crop. Like, I don't know, I'm 58 years old and I've been in this farm all my life. Where did that come from? Where do earthworms come from? I was in, um, myself in 1999, I'll go back to California quick here, in the San Joaquin Valley. I called home and told my wife, I don't know what I'm doing here because in 1999 there was, all it was was brown, I should say soil, but I'm gonna call it dirt. Uh, it was pretty lifeless everywhere. In 2004, five years later, I went out and I was out and digging around with some of the farmers there and we actually found an earthworm and you would have thought they hit the lottery. That's the first earthworm they said they saw in 30 years. And, and I didn't think about it at the time, but where did that earthworm come from? I'm just gonna put it out there, I have no proof, but I think there's possibly that somehow in God's great design, that there has been earthworm eggs, or there has been microbial eggs that have just waiting for the right time to come forth. Now, again, I'm not a scientist, maybe I'm totally wrong, but to me, if you build it, they will come. And I'm gonna tell you here again, nutrient deficiencies are directly related to microbial, microbial deficiencies. So we need to step two here. What is the path to health? Notice I didn't say soil health or human health, I just said path to health, because I'm talking about everything. We need to create a habitat for microbes. That's what green cover seed is doing. That's what cover crops do. That's what less than no tillage does. That's what diversity does. That's what animals do in their reputation. And then here's where we're, this is the direction we wanna go. This is, this is our goal. Vitamins and minerals will become available to plants. Okay, pause. Vitamins and minerals will become available to plants. And then the animals, and or people who eat those plants will benefit. That's a loaded statement, but that's really the crux of what our talk is today. Getting nutrients in the right form into a plant. And I'll just say kind of as an aside here, you wanna get the right nutrients. And, and I'm not saying that just because you all of a sudden, um, you know, grow a cover crop that all of a sudden all these minerals are gonna magically appear. No, we. Some of them have been farmed out. We may have to, we may have to, you know, get them jump started. And I'm not against those products that do that. Okay, I want to be clear on that. Uh, so there is a transition to to get back to that. Uh, I love this this chart here. Uh, a guy named John Frank put it up, and I'm not going to go over it a whole uh, a lot here, but I want to make a point. As you read across that chart from left to right, you know, from the very poor to the very good and excellent. What is really, really, really interesting is, and I think this is a take home message from today's topic. If you can grow plants that are highly nutritional, high mineral, high uh, vitamin content, you will have to use soil health principles to do it. You will have to. So if we, historically, we as farmers have been kind of like told the, you know, you, you, need a, you need to grow cover crops for the environment, and which, which is true, and I'll just leave it at that. Now I'm saying we need to grow cover crops, I mean, excuse me, we need to grow food 
for our own human health benefit. But in order to do that, the environment will take care of itself because you have to employ those practices. So I think this is a really interesting thing. On the very bottom there, look at that bottom there. Look at the, in, look at the disease and insect susceptibility versus resistance. That's kind of like a bonus. If you grow plants with nutrients in them, they're not going to be a susceptible disease and insects. Like a picture I showed in the woods at the beginning. Remember that? They won't. So uh, at some point here, we can definitely reduce our inputs. This is 2022. All of our inputs have gone up. Who knows where we'll be out a year from now. But I'm on the bandwagon of reducing my inputs as much as I can and still grow you know, a, new, uh, a, a healthy crop. Uh, so I love this slide here. Those of you in the reading, this book just came out from uh, David Montgomery and his wife, Ann uh, um, um, Bickley. Uh, what Your Food Ate. That's a great title, by the way. I'm just about wrapping it up. Get it on Amazon or whatever. Get it straight from them. Uh, go on their website. Um, I'm just, th this talks about a lot about nutrient desert. It talks a lot about what I'm talking about today. Uh, so that's a good uh, resource for you there. Where's the future? Where is the future going? Um, I think from the tone of my talk, you probably know, but um, we need to continue to learn and educate as we learn how nutrient-dense food, and I'm going to be very pointed here, can fend off chronic diseases and toxicity issues and poor health that is so prevalent today. Um, I think this is foundational to that. Um, and I'll just say a quick word. It's not in big pharma's interest to have a healthy population. That may sound a little harsh, but I, I'm going to have to say it. Uh, we, we have some headwinds here. Uh, we're going to have to do all we can to help educate people in this. I think the, the, the philosophy and the principle is fairly straightforward, but so many in our society, as soon as they have a, as soon as they sniffle, they want to run to the pharmacy and get something to take care of them. Uh, I'm saying we got to step back and, uh, and try to do better than that. So being able to use this, uh, this nutrient density meter here is going to help us to get our better food choices in the future. And not just for humans, but also for our animals that we're feeding as well. Uh, so uh, again, it's still a, a work in progress. Uh, I, I, people ask me, when is this going to be fully functional? and the confidence level will be high enough that we can actually use this to make decisions. Uh, there is no timeline set on that, according to those who are working with it. Uh, we just had a uh, webinar last week, and uh, the, 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 they're definitely moving forward. Is it one year or two years or five years? I think it's somewhere in there. <laughs> Sorry for not being a little more specific, but uh, that's just kind of where it's at right now. So um, I kind of love this here depiction here. Is it big pharma or is it the farm? Uh, don't get too distracted by the hemp leaves over there on the one side. I'm, I'm promoting the judicious use of, uh, of the CBD products that can be very healthy for us. So, or do you want to take pills? Uh, and I think we know the answer here, but generally speaking, we can, uh, there, there can be a different way uh, to grow food than uh, what we have done. So, um, so thank you. Uh, I'll just remind you, if you wanted my book, it's uh, The Future Proof Farm, stevegroff.com. We'll send it right out to you. And it's not a how to farm book. It's more of what I, the big picture perspectives that I've had here uh, and, and shared today. Uh, it's not all about nutrient density, but uh, a, lot of, a lot on soil health and regenerative agriculture. So Sophie, I, I'll, I'll yield back to you. And uh, I don't know if everybody's sleeping or if there's a few questions, but we'll stick around here for a couple of minutes and uh, see if we can uh, find the answers. Yeah, definitely. I think some more questions will come in here as we get the conversation going. Right. First of all, I just want to say thank you again so much for coming on. And, and you preface too that this device is in its beginning stages, but I think that's part of it that's so exciting because it's open source. Um, so all of the software and everything is available for anyone to look at and anyone in the world can improve upon it or um, give it insight. And everybody's 
welcome to be a part of this journey to, as we're learning more and as we're trying to compile more data, this is, like you said, this is going to be an extremely useful tool and it's really going to impact the future of soil health and human health. Mm -hmm. And so just the fact that we all get to be a part of that and we all get to learn along with everyone else is it's a really exciting part of the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and um, get started with some of these questions. So one of the questions was, have you attempted to calculate the nutrients yield per acre of your squash versus the conventional grown nutrients yield per acre? Uh, never, never, um, never took it to that level. That's an interesting comment. That would be, that would be something fun to do at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and two, I think that some of those um, questions are going to be put to the test in the future as more of this technology becomes more widely used, yeah. and more widely available. Yeah, it's a great um, that's a great question. Yeah, how do you manage invasive species in your no-till system? And if you use herbicides, which you said that you do yeah. use some herbicides, how does that relate to regenerative ag in relation to soil health? Well, I would just add that one of the principles of regenerative agriculture. And it's kind of been coming out here more in the last year or so is context. Mm -hmm. uh, we all live in different areas of geographical and climate, uh, you know, differences. Uh, and so regarding uh, the use of herbicides, I, I kind of answer that question. And my, my first line of defense on weeds is cover crops. Uh, but, you know, I have to plant certain cash crops at certain times. And sometimes those cover crops aren't big enough with their biomass to adequately suppress all the weeds. And so that's where I'll, I'll say it this way, some herbicides come into play. Um, so I try to be judicious in that, like for instance on corn, I have not found a way yet to consistently grow corn without any herbicides, but I shy away from residuals. I don't use residual herbicides. I will, um, I will work at uh, using the cover crops. I have a cover crop roller. Uh, which I think you mentioned in the introduction. But then again, I'll come back with post-emergence with drop nozzles and just spot spray. I'm full, full disclosure, I'm a small farmer in the context of, of, of corn. So it's not like a thousands of acres. So my strategy, again, remember I said context for me is what I do. I wanna mention really quickly that there are some very interesting uh, herbicides being developed that uh, I believe could show some promise uh, and I'll put it in the category of being able to limit the need for glyphosate. Uh, so, um, so that's something that uh, is, is coming down the pike. And I, I think there's, there's some hope for that. Um, so I, I might've missed the very first part of your question there. Uh, was it something other than the herbicide use? Yeah, so it was just um, specifically asking about invasive species. Oh, in yes. The system. So I'm trying to think. When I when you when you came when you asked that I thought, okay, invasive species. You know, the first thing that kind of came to my mind was slugs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the east here we deal with slugs. Slugs are the weirdest animal, or mm -hmm. mollusk they are. Like there's some years in 2018 it was terrible. It, it, even on my farm was was bad. I had to replant some corn. I hadn't done that for a long, long time. And then next the next year, sort of similar conditions, but not quite not many around, and ever since, not many. We had a fairly wet spring again this year in our area. I don't think I saw any slug damage, and nobody did. And, you know, those of us who, you know, that's, that's something I do worry about, I must admit. Um, so as far as other invasive species, I mean, we've had like the spotter and lantern fly come through here. It, it just is, it's, it's marching westward about 50 or 100 miles a year. And went through here last year, they were everywhere. It didn't really affect me too much. They were a nuisance because they, they want to land on your neck, literally right above your collar. Like you'll, you'll have to swat 30 or 40 of them away a day. And I kid you not. This year, they're all west of us. And I just literally just saw two or three today. That's the first I've ever really seen any. So I don't know. They're, they're considered an invasive species. But to answer your question, I haven't really had to deal with anything that was I guess you'd say detrimental in a, in a scale that I had to, you know, react to. Yeah. And too, I mean, you're utilizing diversity on your farm. Right. And I think that that those conditions aren't as welcoming to the invasive species that come in large swaths and end up finding themselves in monoculture 
fields yeah. where they are, I mean, they found exactly what they want. It's easy picking. So when you have diversity, that's a, that's a way to combat that, I think. Absolutely. I, you know, I grow pumpkins and squash and we have our, our field driveways and we plant that into pollinator type uh, plants. And uh, like right now, the buckwheat's flowering and sunflowers are coming out. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. Along the woods, I plant, you know, pollinator and habitat species because that land's not productive anyway. So why not plant something there that benefits and gives the diversity? And it's just a way of thinking. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's just farmers just got to be given some of these ideas and, and they'll do it um, mm -hmm. if they understand the big picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense when you when that clicks in your brain, like, OK, creating that habitat will actually build resiliency into my farm mm -hmm. with actually very little effort. Yeah. Okay, so this question is interesting. They asked if you're seeing an increase in markets where um, farmers and ranchers are capturing higher premiums for their products that um, may have a higher nutrient density. Yeah. Like you said, for example, with your CBD, you are working with um, the university yeah. on paper. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you're if you were able to leverage that information in in your product. Um, yes, I have. Um, I've had uh, buyers contact me uh, for one. It was a restaurant chain, and I mentioned this in the book. Actually, another plug for the book. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a company called Sweet Green. They're here in the East, and then also on the West Coast. Uh, they're high-end soup and salad. I mean, just think Subway, but think soup and salad. That's the way they do it, and. Um, they're really looking for nutrient-dense foods. And so we grew for them for a couple of years. I didn't this year, uh, just things didn't work out kind of on both our sides, but I'm planning to next year. Uh, I grow for Whole Foods, uh, which I'll just leave it at that. People ask me, you know, do you get a premium, you know, growing for Whole Foods? I'm like, no, you don't get a premium, but I will say they pay very fair. And then people say, well, I can't afford to shop there. And I'm like, that's why I sell there. <laughs> so uh uh but all that being said whole foods have been really good to me um and they've been fair uh they like my story they like what i do so that's and i'll just tell you really quick what got me into whole foods is when i said i have cleaner pumpkins i don't there's not they're not dirty because i grow them on cover crops and that was like what 17 years ago we send like 25 tractor trailer loads in there a year uh to the distribution channel and why? Because of cover crops. So yes, clearly yes to your question. Uh, but I've been doing this for a long time. And um, I think that gets lost in some of us or some of us are out there publicly speaking. You can't capture, I'm just to say at the cliche, blood, sweat, and tears, we went through to get to this point. And, and I would just, I just want to give that reality check out there. Those who are just getting into this system now have our shoulders to stand on, and I'm proud to do that. And I'm glad to see this younger generation coming up and doing better than me in, uh, in certain aspects and so forth. That's awesome. I love that. But it takes tenacity. It takes business savvy. You tell someone you grow cover crops, they're not going to just throw out the welcome mat, probably. Um, especially now if you're growing corn and soybeans, who cares? Uh, I think they will someday, uh, but, uh, and I think that may not be too far off, but that being said, it takes a lot of time and effort to, to get to the point where you start getting markets. Yeah, definitely. So this next question, they're asking if you're doing any, any water infiltration testing mm. in your fields. And then they're also asking if you're measuring how much soil is created per year. Oh. Um, so water infiltration, uh, that's been done once in a while with my soil health study. I'm part of a, uh, it's the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture Soil Health Benchmark Study. I think this is our fourth, maybe going our fifth year where we take the exact spot in a field. I have three fields I'm following. I mean, we GPS it and we're within a several feet. Every year we come back and we, we follow the soil health um, uh, parameters using the Cornell soil health test. That's what they use for that. And um, last year they took water infiltrations. Uh, I think a couple years before that they did. 
I don't recall what the numbers are right now, but it's a double ring infiltration, which is a which is a good a good measurement. Um, then, um, what was the second part of your question? So they were asking about um, whether you're measuring soil accumulation, like organic Ooh. matter accumulation, or oh, uh, yes. Uh, so organic matter from my fields that I started to in 1982, 40 years ago. They've gone from low 2%, like 2.2%. I have the numbers on that in 19, uh, early 1980s. And now they're, they're flirting with 6%. Um, uh, so they've almost tripled. Not all my fields are that high, but uh, we're continuing to, to go up. I think it's slowing up a little bit in the last couple of years, which stands to reason. But I got to tell you, Sophie, my goal in my woods the organic matter is a, at, at zero to four inches is 8%. And that's my goal because my farm, obviously up in Pennsylvania, it was wooded when it was, when, when it was turned into agriculture. So I don't probably won't hit it in my lifetime, but um, that's my goal. If I can get it to 8% and I'm trying some more stuff now, there's some new things I'm learning to be able to do that in my situation here that I think is gonna help. So, okay. uh, so that, that's, that's my goal. So we're not measuring the actual soil being built. That's a little difficult to really, really do. Yeah. I can tell you this in my 40 year no-till fields, our, our fields around here are hysterically very stony and small stones and so forth. But in my 40 year no-till fields, the top two inches is pure soil, mm. pretty much pure soil. Mm. So it's not really that I made all that soil because the earthworms churn it up, but it's pure soil. And um, that's always a fun thing to show people uh, mm -hmm. when they come to the farm. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of removing biomass from the field, which right. is the typical scenario, you're actually adding biomass. Yeah. And, and that goes a long ways, especially um, the accumulation over years. Yep. So this next question, which I think we're probably all wondering, and and I did, I sat in on a presentation from Dan Kittredge and um, at a Green America conference several weeks ago, and I was really just kind of blown away at how much research there is to be done in order to calibrate the bionutrient meter and how much we don't know. He actually brought the term, I believe it was nutrient density dark matter. And uh, I was like, wow, I, I mean, yeah, it definitely needs a term because there's so much that we don't know. And in one of the questions that he really asked was, is there variation? And yes, there is variation. You brought up those, those, that graphic and showed that. And now it's a matter of correlating the practices to the variation and then working from there to understand soil health on, on mm -hmm. a deeper level. But this question they asked, how would you define nutrient density and which nutrients, whether elements or compound substances, are we to focus on increasing? It seems like this can be a rather broad topic. Yeah. It, yes, it definitely can. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to be very general here. Uh, be, uh, but, you know, I would define the whole concept of nutrient density is we're trying to bring up the available, and I'm going to say absorbable nutrients in the food that we grow that we as humans or our animals can absorb into our bodies. Um, so it's to increase that. Um, none of us even know what the benchmark or what the standard is. We know what the averages are. So let's just increase it from the average. So I think with the, you know, that's my, my definition of nutrient density is simply just to you know, get more nutrients. Uh, as far as which ones, um, you know, I, I, I'm not a um, nutritionist. Uh, and and to, to tell you which ones are going to be the best bang for your health, I'll say, uh, because every one of us is created differently. We have different circumstances. We have different genetics. Um, and I would, my simple farmer mind would be like, well, I want to raise them all as much as I can because maybe I need to have more calcium uh, for my body. Uh, my wife might need something else and we eat generally the same thing just because. 
uh, and whoever, you know, we don't know. So I'm drawing some of my response here on the CBD side. We talk about CBD all the time, but there's all kinds of other cannabinoids that are in, that are in hemp, CBG, CBN, CBA, and I don't wanna bore you with all the acronyms and numbers. Uh, what we're finding out though, is it's not just about CBD, which is cannabidiol. It's about the entourage effect. It's kind of like taking a multivitamin instead of just one single vitamin. Uh, yeah, sometimes you need, your body needs more vitamin D or, you know, we know that certain ones help us with immunity, iodine, zinc, selenium. Uh, so, you know, when COVID was going on, those of us who were kind of uh, tuned into this stuff was like, okay, I'm going to make sure I got enough selenium iodine, those type of things, you know, that was our hedge uh, against, uh, you know, for, for immunity. So I think there is no specific answer to that. Uh, I think in the future that uh, you take the way, the way medications are prescribed today. It's like, okay, you take this pill. And then usually what happens is, oh, there's a side effect I don't like. Okay, now take this other pill that's about the same or take this other pill and it'll mitigate the side effect. And that's a, I know that's a negative example. What I'm getting to my point is if someone has a situation, they go to a nutritionist, want to deal with, they say, well, you should eat you know, fruits and vegetables and antioxidants. Okay, let's, let's stick with the blueberries, um, the, the ones that have deep, rich colors. And you can kind of hear, I've, I've been studying some of this stuff, that, it, it would, that we should get prescribed fruits and vegetables based on what our body needs are. And we should get tested differently. I mean, I'm not, I've gotten my blood tested uh, for just to see where do I, where am I at in the spectrum of what I should have. So I guess I did get a little long-winded there, Sophie, but um, it is complex and we are nowhere near being able to give prescriptions, but I'll just, again, point to this, you know, we get this dialed in uh, where we can, you know, adjust things a lot quicker than sending things off the lab and all. It's going to be, um, I think it's going to be um, very, very beneficial to humankind. Yeah, definitely. So we'll do two more questions as okay. we are about to go over time. So this person's asking if they can get your email address and yeah. if not, you're okay. Yeah, I'll just tell you, it's Steve at stevegroff.com. Okay. <laughs> Can you get any simpler than that? Yeah, that is pretty simple. Steve at stevegroff.com. Easy to remember. <laughs> and I can't promise I'll get back to you today. I got a lot to do this afternoon, <laughs> but I will get back to you. Yeah. Awesome. And then this person is asking, um, so they're in a crop rotation with corn, beans, small grains, and peas, uh -huh. and they're looking to see how they can work in some type of hemp. They're thinking mm -hmm. that they'll probably be in the industrial hemp market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, funny you ask, because we're actually cutting our first um, fiber hemp, which I think is probably what they're referring to. We're cutting that today. Matter of fact, I can look out the window here. I'm not saying if he's back here cutting yet or not, but my son is out there. That was the intent. Um, I'd have to know where they live and so forth. I, I'm going to just caution, make sure you have a market <laughs> before you plant one seed of him. Uh, the, the industry has been, if you know anything about it, it's been uh, a little crazy, a lot of promises. Uh, and I like to say that we all know that hemp used to be grown everywhere you know, 80 to 100 years ago before it was banned. It can grow, that's not the issue. But because the whole thing was shut down, uh, I like to use the analogy, the cars are built, but there's very few roads to drive them on. We can instantly get into hemp. Any farmer can grow hemp, it's not that hard to grow. But you have a market, a trusted market. Uh, uh, and that's my biggest piece of advice. Do you have a trusted market and go slow? Um, so, uh, I can tell you stories, uh, and and you know that it, it, I'll just leave it at that. A trusted market and 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 someone that knows and give you some good advice. It's not that hard to grow. So, okay, one last question because I found this one that's pretty interesting. So they're asking what you think of a soil health gap analysis, where the micro microbiological activity, including mycorrhiza colonization is measured on the cultured soil and compared to a virgin soil based from the same land. 
Wow. Well, let me just say that would be interesting. Um, I've never done anything quite like that. Um, so I'm not familiar with it. But I love to see, you know, as you heard in my talk, my premise is what can we learn from nature? You know, we've kind of abandoned these principles. And I'm not against technology, I'm not against man made stuff. Um, you know, we're not, you know, there's, there's reality here. I mean, God gave us minds to live. Uh, but then again, I think we've gone too far in a lot of these things in agriculture and the way we grow our food. And you could say, you know, large corporations have, we're, we've become slaves. And um, I think for those of us who are maybe, should I say, alert to what's going on in the world these days, boy, things are getting a little bit uncertain. And, um, you know, if it comes to the point where we have to literally grow our own food, I think farmers could, uh, but it, it, this whole thing that we're talking about today is, is important, I think, for um, just that consumers get a little closer to how their food was grown. Because see, if, if the consumers will, um, I'll say it this way, demand nutrient-dense food, farmers will respond. Uh, right now, it's kind of like pushing a rope a little bit. You asked about there's a premium. Well, not so much, but I could see a day coming when, um, you know, there'll be companies that, that sell retail that will demand that you come up to a certain standard of the way you grow your food. Or does it pass the nutrient meter test? And uh, farmers have not gotten paid for this. They've not gotten paid for packing their corn with nutrients. They get paid on yield. and um, you know, hence, we kind of have a messed up food system because of that. When you look at it from the context of healthy, because yield is not always the healthiest to get that yield that we get paid for. I'm not faulting anybody. I'm just acknowledging what I see as our current reality. So yeah, am I bucking the system? Yes. Uh, but I know there's a lot more people that are, are right with me in that. We're a small, small minority at this point. But I see that's where the future's going, and I want to be right there. I want to learn, and I certainly have a lot to learn yet, uh, and I want to learn. But that's why I'm so glad that you guys are doing a webinar like this, that uh, where we can learn together. So, um, so that's where I'm at on it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. And yeah. you guys can visit his website right there and um, Bionutrient Foods Association as well. I'm sure they're going to be coming out with more information and um, we'll maybe be able to answer some of your guys' questions in a little bit more detail. So um, next week, we're going to have Aaron Martin and Jimmy Emmons on um, same time Tuesday at 12 12 o'clock um, Central Standard Time, and they are going to be talking about prescribing food as medicine. So mm -hmm. a very similar topic, just a different angle next week, and we'll look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you, guys.